press stand up or we're watching online, we're trying to get folks reconnected because over the summer, we really have been a little bit disconnected, not sure who's here or not who's not here. And so if you are on uh, Facebook, then it's really helpful if you like a post, if you comment on it. That also helps get our uh, distribution of our content further, right? Not just on your things, but that's how the Facebook algorithms work. And so uh, like things, uh, share things, all of that is very helpful. Um, and so now for uh, our next announcement, I want to invite Rayanne to come have a uh, talk about Marriage Night. But again, she comes up, just pay attention to uh, the uh, website, pay attention to Facebook, pay attention to those email blasts for this announcement and uh, many others. So if you haven't looked on uh, one of the church announcement sites to see about our uh, marriage night program that's coming up, I just wanted to identify myself so that you know the face connected with the name and the flyer. So I'm Ray Ann Nevue. My husband and I, even though he's not here, we did just celebrate our 33rd wedding anniversary. So, yeah, it's been great. We recommend it. Um, so I wanted to just invite everybody to consider uh, joining the Marriage Night program. We um, are doing a delayed showing, so our showing is this Saturday night coming up. We invite you for dinner for two uh, at five o'clock. Bring your own dinner. We'll supply a table. And then the program is running from 6 to 9.30 if you're going to join us in person. You can also do it from home. The advantage there is that you actually have 30 days in which to watch the program. So if you sign up through me, you can get a discounted registration fee. Uh, email is best, so it is there. So I just wanted to say that even though uh, everything has changed in this pandemic, that God's heart for our marriage has not. It has stayed the same. Our patterns around the house, our interactions with each other, both in the house and out of the house, have changed. Like our marriage, like our families, those are the things that will reap a harvest when we pay attention to them. So for Stephen and I, we are intentional about our marriage, and we participate in workshops, and we go on marriage retreats, and we are passionate about God blessing on marriages. So um, we hope that you will come enjoy uh, a little humor in our common struggles, strength for our spiritual journey, and take an evening to recharge with your spouse. So uh, please talk to me after the service outside at a safe six foot distance, and uh, I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Good morning, church. enter into worship this time. Calling every daughter, calling every son, all who've been adopted through a sacrifice of love. There's no need for you to fear, your debts have all been cleared. Calling all the downcast who feel like they're alone, anyone who's longing 
for a family of their own. God's prepared a place for you. He's calling you to come and sing, to come and dance. The Father's singing over you. Come rejoice and be glad, for God delights in you. Calling all who've wandered, gone off on their own, anyone who wonders if they're welcome back home. The God of grace makes all things new. Come rejoice and be glad, for God delights in you. Heavenly Father, you chose us to be the objects of your love in spite of all that we've done. You gave your beloved son to die for us, to make us daughters and sons. We gather now to praise you, Lord. And we pray that your presence and your Holy Spirit will guide us and help us do that this morning. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Stand if you're able, and we're going to praise the Waymaker. there was no way. I want you to just lift it up. 
If I hear it, I'm going to repeat it so that maybe people at home can hear it. And if you're at home, type that in, in the comments on the feed. How has God made a way in your life, church? Meets every need. Amen. God. God made a way, and Lisa, maybe you reckon you can attest to this. God made a way in school. So we started school and got to see the faces of all my students, and it made all of the craziness worth it. Yeah. Absolutely, Margie. Yeah, if, if you didn't hear that, it's wonderful that we can be together. Even though it's different, we're seeing each other from, you know, just the eyes up or whatever. But it is wonderful to be together as a church. And we thank God for making a way for that. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you. We, uh, there's, that, there's so much negativity out there, right? Share your story with a friend. Say what's good. Those of you who post stuff online, post what's good. God's doing amazing things. God is moving. God is making a way. And I think that um, we have a chance as believers to share that with the world, right? That he keeps his promises. That he heals. That he makes a way when we think there is no way. Amen? So let's share that more than we've been. And I, I, I'm preaching myself right now. <laughs> I am preaching to myself. We got to do that, yeah. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you are. Way
as we enter into this time of prayer together. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you and we do. We praise you for being able to make a way where there is no way. But Lord, we pray that you would bring our gaze to you so that we wouldn't be looking at how you can make a way back to the old way, but you could make a new way. Lord, we confess, we so often look at how we can put our agenda back into place. But Lord, your plan is so huge. You are gunning for the world. Lord, you want to bring us to a place of new life. And we look forward to that day, Jesus, when you will return and you will establish your kingdom of righteousness and love and where there will be no need of the sun because your glory will so shine and we will experience that glory unfettered by sin. And yet, Lord, you call us to reflect that glory, reflect that love in our life now. But so many times, Lord, we, we want to go back to Egypt because at least we had quail there or at least we had food there. And we neglect that we can go to Mount Sinai and see your presence and your power working in us and through us in a new way, a way that perhaps we hadn't seen before. So God, we pray that you would lift our eyes to you and we would open our hearts to receive all the things that you have for us. And God, we know that all of the difficulties of this world, Lord, you, you allow them because it, it puts in us that desire for the newness. It puts us in that desire to experience you and all that you have. And Lord, we do, we, we think about the, the wildfires in, on the West Coast. And yes, Lord, we lift them up to you, the, the first responders and the, the firefighters and all of those who are working tireless, tirelessly to put those fires out. And we thank you for their work. Lord, we pray that you'd send rain. But at the same time, Lord, when we, we look at those fires, we, we, it's a reminder, Lord, that you have something new for us. Every calamity, this pandemic, is a reminder, Lord, that this is not all that there is. And that we are hoping for a new day, a new life, a restored world. So put that desire in us, Lord. Lord, we also lift up those who are both mourning the loss of loved ones. As we commemorated 9-11, 19 years ago. Lord, you know those who are missing their loved ones because they were taken from. Lord, bind the brokenhearted. And Lord, for those of us who are mourning the loss of loved ones for other reasons, be a very present comfort. Lord, I, I lift, up, lift up Bev Henneman. Lord, I, I lift up the Lions family who's Bob's morning and lost his brother. And all those others, Lord, who are here, and death is a reminder to look to you for that new eternal life. And we pray that your presence would be powerfully felt among each one who's mourning today. Lord, we lift up little Caleb Mullins, who's having scheduled to have cochlear implant surgery on Tuesday. We pray that you guide the doctor's hands and that this surgery would be successful and it would be a, a new season for his life. We pray for his parents, his family, to give them peace in this time. Lord, we pray for Terry Tronkey, that you have her shin splints that are so debilitating, bring her comfort. And Lord, for each Thing that we have, Lord, there's just been testimonies of how you've made a way for healing, how you've made a way through so many things. 
And so we lift these up again. All of these difficulties, all of these sicknesses, all of these needs. Yes, we lift them up and ask that you'd intervene, but we also ask that you'd use them to put in our hearts that desire for the new, restored, eternal creation. And that we would pursue that in how we live our lives day in and day out. And Lord, we pray these things in the way that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand.
Lord God, that grace is the biggest gift that we have received from you, Lord, and truly is all we need. The grace that you have showered upon us, Lord, through your Son, Jesus Christ, that our debts are paid, that, God, you call us to be daughters and sons. Lord, we are forever, we are eternally grateful. God, for the grace that you show us, that you give us, and that opportunity that is new every morning with you. Thank you for your presence here this morning. And we ask that you will continue to guide our worship as we hear your word, that you will speak through Pastor Joe and empower him, God, as he kicks off a new sermon series. Lord, I pray that this will be um, a new time of growth for all of us. Lord, as we dig into your word, plant that seed of your word in our hearts, Lord, and cause growth. Help us be open to you now. We love you, we praise you, we lift you on high, and we thank you for meeting us here right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Over to you, Joe. <laughs> you know, one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that uh, Hollywood has been not uh, releasing any new movies. <laughs> you might say, well, why, why is that good? Well, I don't know about you. I used to like superhero movies. But now that they keep releasing them and they're like on the 100th one, I'm like, all right, enough already with these superhero movies. At first they were interesting. Like, I know the Wonder Woman uh, movie is then delayed. But I don't need no Wonder Woman. I have a Wonder Woman and Wendy Green. <laughs> she hates it when I do stuff like that. But you know, in in the superhero movies, one of the things they inevitably do, one of the plot lines that they have, is that, for instance, you know, Peter Parker has to step into his identity as Spider-Man. Right? But Spider-Man can't lose touch with his identity of, with Peter Parker, or whatever. That there's a part, that's one of the common themes, is that in order to truly be the hero that you're supposed to be, you have to figure out who you are, right? your identity. And that resonates with us, even outside of superhero movies, because it's something we all have to do as well. That's a question that we all grapple with, yes, very often in our adolescence, but throughout life, who are you? And that is such an important question because who you are will affect how you look at the world, how you look at yourself, how you interact with others. So that question, who are you, it is crucial. And every person must answer that question to live effectively. And so for this fall sermon series, we are looking at that question, who are you? And we're looking at it through the lens of the book of Ephesians, because in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul seeks to show the Ephesian church all they are in Christ. He wants them to grapple with the, their identity in Christ and how it makes a world of difference and should make a world of difference and how they see themselves, but also how they see each other. Because that question, who are you, it's not just a question for individuals, it's a question for groups of people. Who are you? Who are you, church? Who are you, Christians? Who are you? It is the crucial question. It's one of the most significant questions in our lives. So, for example, someone says, who are you? Well, I'm a green. That's my last name. But the neon again. What does that mean? It means more than I'm just not very tall and I've got stubby little fingers. I mean, it means that, because that's what we greens are. We have stubby little fingers. Um, although my son Isaiah is breaking the mold, but that's more of Wendy's side, Wonder Woman's side, um, of the family. He's tall and got long fingers. It means more than that. It means that I have 
a, a greater both privileges and responsibilities attached to Wendy Green, Isaiah Green, Abby Green, and my parents, Alan Lynn Green. It's a part of who I am that affects how I look at other people, especially others with names Green. And likewise, the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians, as he, he wants the Ephesians to understand that because they are in Christ, they are a new creation, that they have a new family, they have a new father, heavenly father, they have a whole new world available to them. So let's look. This, uh, throughout this series, we are going, again, through the book of Ephesians. You know that's my preference. There's a couple reasons why I think it's so important to go through books of the Bible. One is so that I'm not always preaching my favorite sermon. I'm forcing me to go through the text. But it's also showing us how to read in context. Because one of the difficulties, one of the ways that people misuse the Bible is they take their favorite verse out of context and then use it as a weapon. No, it's not meant to do that. We are supposed to uh, put ourselves under the text, understand what the authors intended, and then allow God to speak to us through it. So that's why, uh, you know, I prefer to go through books of the Bible. Um, and so now we're going to the book of Ephesians. And let's start. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to stop there. So the book of Ephesians is actually a letter, a letter written from the apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. And that's why it begins like many of the letters did in that day. It, you know, Paul's saying, hey, I'm Paul. He's identifying himself. He's like, I'm Paul, an apostle. And then he's identifying who the letter's going to, the church at Ephesus. And sometimes in Paul's letters, he'll really expound upon who the recipients of his letter are. But here, it's just simple, to the saints in Ephesus. But in the body of the letter, that's where Paul starts to expound about who they are by virtue of who God is. And right away, notice, we're going to go to verse 3. Paul points to God to Christ. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Let's stop there. Right away, Paul says, blessed be God who blesses us. Yes, Paul is about to expound on all of the blessings that believers have and who they are that they must recognize uh, uh, that their identity brings them. But let's be clear. We can't know who we are until we truly know who God is. And, and I realize in our self-centered, individualistic culture, that's a hard thing to hear because we know, oh, who am I? I need to look within myself. No, the Bible says in order to really know who we are, we need to know first who God is. Because you know what? We are not first. We are not the first cause of the universe. We're not the center of the universe. The creator is. And so if we truly want to understand who we are, first and foremost, we need to understand who God is. And that's why the apostle Paul starts out his letter. Yes, he is going to expound on all the blessings that the Christians have in Ephesus because of, um, um, of what God pours down upon them. But he first wants them to understand that, no, no, this is all from God. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Because it's only when we understand who God is that we can truly understand who we were meant to be in Him. So that's why Paul starts it out like that. But then Paul continues describing how God lavishes on us a wonderful identity as His fully forgiven, fully established children through God's work in Christ. So let's move to verse 4. So yes, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will 
to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have a redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Now this passage is so packed, but it's amazing. Paul go, gives the typical greeting in verse 1 and 2, and, and, then, and then he just launches, he just launches into all the blessings that the Ephesians have from God. And those blessings, they actually glorify the giver of those blessings. And so let's look at the blessings that are listed in this, packet, this passage. And I really can't unpackage them all because there's just there's so many of them. But let's try. So the first blessing he talks about is that God chooses to adopt us as his children. Right? That's what verse 5 says. Right? He predestined us for adoption to himself. And which means we have an inheritance. That's what verse 11 says, right? that we have an inheritance. That makes sense. When you're adopted, when you go into someone's family, a part of being a part of that family is that the, your parents pass things down to you, your inheritance. Right? Well, now that you're a child of God, God passes down his things to you. Isn't that amazing? I mean, God is the most powerful, the most loving, the most patient being in the entire universe, and he's passing his things down to you. Not only that, God has the patents to every created thing, because he's the inventor of everything. Uh, imagine that. Um, imagine being adopted by Bill Gates, and he is passing down all the Microsoft patents to you. I mean, that would be amazing. Well, Bill Gates, he, he got nothing compared to God. God is, has the patents to the entire universe. And he is passing those things down to his children. So those things open up to you as well by being his children. Now, I get it. God's adoption, God adopting us as his children, it should totally blow us away. But one of the reasons why I don't think it blows us away quite as much as it should is because of that theology. Um, and what I mean by that is that you've heard a popular expression, but it's unbiblical, oh, we're all God's children. That's actually not biblical. What's biblical is that God has created all things. We're made in his image, but really the relationship between us and God is one of estrangement. That if we were ever part of his family, well, you know, we, we ran away from home. And that biblically, we are God's children only based by God adopting us, bringing us into his family, because naturally, we are actually estranged from God, and we're actually enslaved to the enemies of God, and we are serving their purposes, going against God's purposes in the world. That's the biblical truth. And so the idea that we're children of God? That should totally blow us away because, wait a minute, we, we're estranged from God. We're enemies of God. We're serving his enemies, not God. And yet, he's adopting us? And that, therefore, we have an inheritance and he's giving us all the patents, patents to the universe, everything, even though we're estranged from him? Again, that should totally flatten us out in grateful admiration. And that's why... The Apostle Paul starts his letter, Blessed be God. But how does he do this? How does he adopt us? 
Well, another blessing that's listed here in Ephesians is redemption. Redemption. And again, that's a kind of word that doesn't flatten us out with praise because what we hear redemption, of course, what do we think of? Oh, I can get my five cents back on my, my can, my Pabst Blue Ribbon can, right? <laughs> but biblically, redemption means so much more. Redemption is used in the context of if you were a slave, you normally were a slave because you owed an incredible debt. Right? And that one of the ways you got your freedom was someone would redeem you. They would pay off your debt. And so in verse 7, it says, In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. So in order to adopt us, God first has to redeem us. Why does he have to do that? Well, if we are slaves to God's enemies, and when I say that, what are we slaves? We're slaves to sin. We're, we're enslaved to, uh, to our selfishness, to our pride, to lies, to lust, to all of those things contrary to God. We're enslaved to those things. And if we're going to be adopted by God, he first has to buy us back from that sin. And that's what he says he does through Christ, through Christ's redemption. In Christ, God basically trades the perfect love and devotion, eternal life that his, that his son has, that Jesus has in himself. He trades those things for our sin, for our separation with God. He redeems us so that we're no longer slaves to God's enemies. No, now we're free. And what are we free for? We're free to be adopted into God's family. In Christ, God trades the life of his beloved son for yours. You're freed from your enemies. You can now be adopted into God's family. So he pays his life so that you get yours. That's a, another one of the blessings that we have in Christ. Another one that's listed here is that, in, uh, uh, that God lets us in on the mystery of his plan and purposes. Uh, verse 8 through 10, it says, In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. So as his children, he lets us in on what he's doing. And again, this connects to our identity, and that so many times we're like, well, I don't know what I should do with my life. We, we want to know what, what we should be doing. Well, God lets us in on what he's doing. And he, through his word, through the scripture, as God has revealed it to prophets and apostles, to Jesus, and now it's in his word as we give ourselves to the reading of God's message to us, we start to understand God has a plan. He has a purpose for this world. And where I figure out what my place in the world is, I first need to figure out, well, what's God doing? Because right? he's the first cause. And so as I see that God has a plan of redemption, God has a plan of love uh, and righteousness for this world through Christ, then I have a, a wisdom, I have a knowledge I didn't have before. So part of the blessing of being in Christ is God lets you in on his plan. Number four, another blessing it says is we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 13. It says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is a seal. He is a, a, a guarantee. Meaning, as his children... God, one of the things we inherit is the Spirit of God. He gives us his Holy Spirit as a guarantee. So that now we have not just ourselves, our own spirit to rely on, we have the Spirit of God to rely on, which includes relying on the Spirit to fully and finally bring our inheritance that we have in Christ. Because here's the thing, we just talked about or we prayed about how all of this difficulty in the world, the wildfires, the pandemic, the... the um, 
the upheavals that we see, that it's meant to stir in us that desire for God, for Christ returning and fully and finally making everything right? Well, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee. He's like a signature. He's God's signature. When God signs his will, it is that you would have an inheritance, that you would receive all that you were meant to receive as his children. And the Holy Spirit now is given to us so that we know, yeah, that full and final inheritance, that glory, I can trust that it's mine because Christ has given me that seal of the Spirit. And then the final blessing that I'm going to talk about, many more, is that you were meant to be to the praise of God's glory. Look at how many times in this short section Paul connects all the blessings that God gives us to praising God's glory. So, you know, verse 6, right? Uh, adoption to himself, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. Uh, verse 7, according to the riches of his grace. Verse 12, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. So one of the blessings is that we were meant to be to the praise of God's glory. Now, this might not resonate with us because we, again, we're so egocentric, but as children, we are meant to show forth who God is. As he adopts us as his children, we're meant to reflect his grace. That is a blessing because of well, several reasons, but one is that it aligns us with the purpose of creation. Because you know, a part, well, part of the purpose of the creation is to glorify God the creator. So when we are aligned with that, and we are showing forth to the praise of God's glory, we're aligning with creation. And not only that, but there is deep meaning in being part of sincerely honoring someone who deserves it. So maybe some of you um, watched the last couple of days some of the commemoration to the first responders who, who ran into the buildings, the 9-11 you know, World Trade Center when it collapsed. Maybe some of you have even participated in one of those commemorations. And in that, there is a deep sense of meaning. Wait, th th these people deserve to be honored. Like, this is right, because when people were running away, they ran into. And so a part of the blessing of being children of God is we are meant to be to the praise of his glory. Because the amazing thing that Paul describes here is that God's glory shines brightest when we simply receive his glory grace, his gracious blessing. And so doing, we reflect the grace of the giver. So who, who is God? Yes, that's the first question. But we reflect who God is when we truly embrace his grace. Because who is God? He's glorious. He's full of grace. Again, look at how many times in that short section, to the praise of his glorious grace, according to the riches of his grace, to the praise of his glory in verse 12, to the praise of his glory in verse 14. Like, yeah, that passage is packed with a lot of stuff, but one of the consistent themes is to the praise of his glory. Keep pointing to God. Because we see who God is through his actions towards us. And his actions are blessings. His actions are adoption as his children. But it's all based in who God is. God is prior. And we must always keep that foremost in our minds. Our identity is grounded in God's identity and the glorious blessing we receive because of him. And, and God, and Paul constantly emphasizes God's, these blessings of this new identity in Christ they're all from God's grace. They're all from God's initiative. And look, the only thing we basically contribute is hearing and believing. That's what verse 13 says. But in here, God, he's the giver. God the Father is the giver. He's the one who blesses. He's the one who chooses. He's the one who predestines. He's the one who purposes. He's the one who forgives. He's the one who lavishes. He's the one who seals. He's the one who redeems his treasured possession. 
And, and just in case, we might think that, well, wait, maybe God responds to us because we're so great. Paul says in verse 4 that God chose us before the foundation of the world. There can be no mistake that God is the one who lavishes the grace. It's a part of his eternal plan. And Paul emphasizes again through repetition, look at this, that his plan conforms to God's good pleasure, his will, verse 9 and 5, 9, 11. It doesn't come from external forces. It doesn't come from other consideration. It springs up from the heart of God. And the heart of God is a, is a heart full of grace where he lavishes his love. It's, grace is unmerited favor. The self-sacrificial grace that originates in the heart of God is how we are to understand God's nature. And that's why to receive that grace, that gift as children of God, we first need to look at the God of grace, not to ourselves. See, and maybe you've been checking out this religion, this Christian, Christianity thing, and you're thinking, all right, you keep looking at yourself and, and trying to assess, uh, am I doing the right thing? Am I this? Am I that? No, that's the, you're starting at the wrong place. You first need to start at who is God. And he is full of grace. And that's why the Apostle Paul is able to just, just write this ton of blessings that we have because he knows who God is. And so if you want to find out who you are, who you were meant to be, stop looking inward. Uh, again, I know that goes against everything our society tells you. Stop looking inward. Start looking upward. Because it's the God of grace. The God of grace who... Before the foundation of the world, before you were even born, he set you aside and said, I want you to be my child. And even though, yes, we've been sold into slavery, going against God, even now, your whole life, you may have been like, yeah, I'd go against God's purposes. Even now, if the Spirit is moving in you to say yes to God, this adoption, it's not based on what you've done, whether good or bad, it's based on who God is. And if you trust that God is full of grace and abounding in steadfast love, then you can come to him now and just say, yes, God. Yes, I want to be your child. I receive your redemption. I want to trade my brokenness, my sin, my slavery for your freedom and eternal life in Christ. That's, it's, that's all it is. It's about God's grace. It's not about what you've done. Take him up on that offer. Receive that new identity as God's child, and it will change how you live. It will change your eternity. But perhaps you've done that. Perhaps you're like, yes, I've accepted Christ. I'm a child of God. Are you walking in that grace? Maybe you're struggling with your identity. Again, that the answer is to look to God, to look at your place as God's child. And a good place to start is right here, Ephesians 1. Look at all that our Father has lavished on us in his love. That is what you were meant to receive as his child. All things of God he wants to pass down to you. Look first to God and see who he says you are in Christ. And then glory in that. So as we're going to pray, but let this next psalm be our prayer. Let it be your prayer. Let's pray. Lord, as we sing this final song, we do so acknowledging that you are the great giver, that you are full of grace, abounding in steadfast love, that just as the Apostle Paul wrote, Lord, you have lavished us as your children. We don't deserve it. We were slaves to sin, but you've redeemed us through Christ. We sang amazing grace, Lord. It is your amazing grace. You saved us. Let us walk in that identity. And Lord, if there's any here or watching who don't identify as your child, Lord, may your spirit move in them in such a powerful way that they receive you and receive your gift of grace. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you're able. Thank you. 
of information, but let it be your, your theme song, not just for this week, but for our lives, that we have been redeemed, we've been set free, and so when we walk into this world, we walk in newness of life, we walk in that wonderful truth, we go rejoicing, so even when stuff is bad, you know, and there's a lot of bad stuff going on, that we have that knowledge that we are children of God, and it changes everything. So let us go, let us go in peace, let us go in the grace and knowledge and mercy of God. Amen? Amen. Amen.